Welcome to Wake TV, I'm Eric Curry. Well, the summer is about to end, but that didn't stop several events and exciting programs from taking place here in Wake County. Stay tuned to find out what went on. All restaurants in Wake County are inspected by county's certified food inspectors. But there are some tips that you can take to make sure your family is safe while preparing food at home. We'll share with you four different segments on some of those tips throughout this show. Patrick has the first. Keeping your refrigerator at a constant temperature under 40 degrees Fahrenheit is one of the most effective ways to prevent foodborne illness. The reason is simple. Cold temperatures slow the growth of germs that can cause food poisoning. But you can't just throw things in the fridge. It's important to remember a few simple rules when it comes to keeping your foods chilled. Keep your refrigerator at 40 degrees Fahrenheit or below. Use a refrigerator thermometer to make sure your food is being stored at the right temperature. Be sure to put your refrigerator thermometer in the main compartment, not on the door, and avoid overstuffing your fridge so the cold air can circulate and keep your food safe. When it comes to your freezer, the same general rules apply, but make sure the freezer temperature remains zero degrees Fahrenheit or below. Always put meat, poultry, eggs, seafood, and other things that can go bad quickly into the refrigerator as soon as you get home from the store. Never leave fresh cut fruit and veggies or raw meat, poultry, seafood, or eggs out at room temperature for more than two hours. When it's 90 degrees outside or more, don't leave these foods at room temperature for more than one hour. The same goes for leftovers. When you have a lot of leftovers, divide them into small containers so they can cool quickly in the refrigerator. Defrost frozen foods in the refrigerator, in cold water, or the microwave. Food thawed in cold water or the microwave must be cooked right away. Germs that cause foodborne illness grow well at room temperature. That is why you should never defrost food at room temperature. This is also why you should always marinate food in the refrigerator. Remember, when traveling or packing your lunch, use ice or ice packs to keep your food cold. So remember, it's important to know how to store your food in the fridge so it can... Chill! Did you know one in 30 baby boomers has hepatitis C? People born between 1945 and 1965 are five times more likely to have hepatitis C. Hepatitis C can hide in the body for years or even decades and can cause psoriasis, cancer, and even death. The good news is hepatitis C can be treated. The first step is to get a simple, free blood test. Don't be a statistic. Visit wakegov.com slash hep C today to schedule your free blood test. Recently, we teamed up with the county's waste services team to take a tour of the Sunoco Recycling Center here in Raleigh. Welcome to the Sunoco Recycling Murph located in Raleigh, North Carolina. Come inside and take a tour with us. A Murph is a sorting facility called a Material Recovery Facility. All the recyclables from your house, school, or a business comes to one of these facilities. At Sunoco, they take our used paper, cardboard boxes, plastic bottles and containers, glass bottles and jars, and metal food and drink cans. Remember, never leave anything sticky and gooey on the inside of containers. What I miss, ick. This facility uses a lot of mechanical equipment to help them sort out each kind of material so it can go to a factory and be made into something new. Workers stand beside the conveyor belts to help sort out certain materials and remove things that may be dangerous to them or the machinery. Uh-oh, looks like somebody tried to recycle a green garden hose. Remember, never put ropes, hoses, clothing, 
or anything that can be tangled up in your recycling bin. One of the first steps to sorting at Sunoco is to remove all glass. A machine called a glass breaker shakes the material against sharp metal blades so that tiny pieces of glass fall through tiny holes in a screen and are moved to an outside collection area. Did you notice the white stuff that came out of the chute? That's shredded paper and it should never be mixed with your recyclables. It's like confetti. It sticks to everything. Next is the removal of all different types of paper. Cardboard is separated first because the boxes are so big. Then the paper sorter has wheels that spin and grip the pieces of paper, kind of like a sticky lint roller. Anything that's not flat, like paper, will continue on down the line. By the way, remember not to put shredded paper in your bins and carts. Next is the separation of plastics, which can be tricky. A machine with a laser scanner can detect if a bottle is a certain type of plastic and send it to the right bin. The workers help look for plastics like milk jugs, water and soda bottles, and colorful laundry soap containers. The one type of plastic they don't want is our plastic grocery bags. These bags get tangled and wrapped around the paper sorting wheels, which can damage the machines. Remember, you can take the empty bags back to the grocery store to be recycled. Once the plastics are removed from the conveyor belt, the final sorting step is to remove all the metals. Did you know there are two different types of metals in the stuff we use? The first one is steel metal, which is most of our soup and vegetable cans are made out of. A strong, powerful magnet picks them up and releases them into a very large bin. The second kind of metal is aluminum, which our drink cans are made out of. Aluminum is not attracted to magnets, so an eddy current machine uses electricity across the top of a conveyor belt to find and separate the drink cans. See how the cans jump and fly into the bin? Now that everything is sorted by its type, they can bundle the material together in a machine called a baler, which makes a one-ton rectangular bale. Here comes one now. The bales are either put on a truck to be shipped or stacked up like you see here to be sold later. Each row of bales has a sign labeled above it with the type of material in each bale. For more information, visit the website on your screen. Did you know one in 30 baby boomers has hepatitis C? People born between 1945 and 1965 are five times more likely to have hepatitis C. Hepatitis C can hide in the body for years or even decades and can cause psoriasis, cancer, and even death. The good news is hepatitis C can be treated. The first step is to get a simple, free blood test. Don't be a statistic. Visit wakegov.com slash hep C today to schedule your free blood test. You can't see or smell germs in the kitchen that can cause food poisoning. Germs can be spread easily to and from food, on your hands, and on surfaces like utensils and countertops. Keeping your hands and kitchen clean are very important in keeping your food safe to eat. When you wash your hands, turn on warm water, wet your hands, apply soap, and rub them together for 20 seconds. You can sing the happy birthday song twice. That takes about 20 seconds. Be sure to rub all surfaces of your hands. After you're done, rinse your hands and dry them with a clean cloth or paper towel. If you're using a paper towel, use it to turn off the faucet when you're done. It's important to wash your hands before, during, and after food preparation, especially when handling uncooked eggs or raw meats. When it comes to cleaning your kitchen, everything you see needs to be cleaned from time to time. When you're cooking, be sure to wash your countertops, cutting boards, and utensils with soap and hot water after preparing each food item and before you go on to the next food. Clean your fridge regularly with hot water and liquid soap and dry with paper towels. Be sure to wipe up spills as soon as they happen. Wash cloth towels used for cleaning often in the hot cycle of the washing machine. Finally, Rinse your fruits and vegetables under running water, even those with skin and rinds you are not going to eat. Rub firm skinned fruits and vegetables or use a vegetable brush to scrub them while rinsing them. Keep yourself and your family safe from germs that can cause food poisoning by keeping your hands and your kitchen clean. 
Tragically, every year, there are reports that kids are left in high cars, creating serious injury and even death. Elizabeth shows us what Wake County recently did to alert the public about this deadly problem. Each year, children, the elderly, and other vulnerable populations are put at risk of suffering heat stroke by being left in locked cars. To bring awareness to this issue, Wake County, Safe Kids North Carolina, and the North Carolina Department of Insurance held a S'more Dangerous Than You Think demonstration outside Wake County's Health Department offices. We spoke with public health educator Suzanne Ledoyan to learn more. Wake County Human Services partners with Safe Kids North Carolina every year to do an annual hot car um, press event. And what we're doing today is we're demonstrating to the public the um, temperature inside a vehicle and outside to show the dangers of children being left alone in a vehicle and how rapidly that, in that temperature can increase. And in a very short period of time, we can have a fatality. Oh my goodness, a car, within the first 10 minutes, that temperature can rise 20 degrees. I mean, it is, it is rapid and it is quick. This is not something that takes hours. This is something that can take minutes. We're also here today to um, pay respects to the 16 children that we've lost so far this year, with two of those children being in North Carolina. And simply put, we're asking the public to join us and be stewards of the children in our community. And if you see a child unattended in a vehicle, to please call 911. That is the most important thing that we all can do and all can have a part in taking st action steps to prevent these fatalities. Today, we also um, are excited to be demoing new child restraint and vehicle technologies that have alerts and reminders that will actually alert the driver that that child may have been left in that child restraint or that something was left on that vehicle back seat. We have two technologies here. First, we'll start with the car seat that we have in the back seat. This actually has a sensor safe system on the car seat, which is offered by Evenflow. And what that does is give the parent an audible alert through the car's onboard diagnostic system when the parent reaches its destination. The second feature on this car is by the actual car, car manufacturer. GM actually offers a reminder on some of their models now to remind the parent to actually check the, to see if something's in the back seat. So anytime the back door is open, before the car started or right after the car started, when they get to the destination, it actually gives them a reminder to check the back seat. One of the main things that we do recommend that parents do or consider doing or any driver of a vehicle that has children is to put something that you absolutely know that you're going to have to have at your next stop. It could be your left shoe. People laugh. I say take off your left shoe, put it in the back seat. You're going to stop and you're going to put that left shoe probably back on your foot. Be creative in like leaving your lunch box in the back seat or your phone or your shoes even. So when you get to your desk destination, you open the back door and then you find out and you realize, oh, my child is still here. I think what we want people to take away most importantly for us is really to forget about the temperature. There is never an acceptable time to leave a child unattended or alone in a vehicle. Queremos recordarle a la comunidad latina nunca dejar a los niños solos en el auto. Las temperaturas de alta calor Eh, puede traer eh, fatalidad a los niños, así que recordemos papás eh, de poner recordatorios en el asiento trasero para no olvidar a nuestros niños en el auto. Nunca deje a su niño solo en el auto ni por un segundo. For more information on child passenger safety, visit the website on your screen. You can't tell if food is fully cooked just by looking at it. Food has to be cooked to a high enough temperature to kill the germs inside that could cause foodborne illness. USDA research shows that one out of four hamburgers turn brown before it is cooked to a safe temperature on the inside. The only way to make sure your foods are cooked to the appropriate temperature is to correctly use a cooking thermometer. There are different kinds of food thermometers, so it's important to follow the directions for the kind of thermometer you have. No matter what type of thermometer you have, always wash your thermometer with hot water and soap after every use. When measuring the temperature of your food, be sure to put your thermometer in the thickest part of the food, making sure not to touch bone, fat, or gristle. After taking the temperature in the thickest part of the food, 
make sure to test the food in several other places to make sure it's all at a safe temperature. Different types of meats and foods need to be cooked to different temperatures. It's a good idea to have a quick reference sheet in your kitchen with the specifics. Cook all roasts, chops, and steaks, both pork and beef, to a minimum temperature of 145 degrees Fahrenheit with a three minute rest time after being taken away from the heat. Cook all poultry to a minimum temperature of 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Cook all ground meat to a minimum temperature of 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Cook fish to 145 degrees Fahrenheit or until the fish is opaque and separates easily with a fork. Cook your eggs until the yolk and white are firm, not runny. Don't use recipes that call for raw or partly cooked eggs. Bring sauces, soups, and gravies to a boil when you reheat them, and heat leftovers completely to 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Whatever you're cooking for your family, make sure you follow the simple rules of cooking to a safe temperature. It's the easiest way to keep your family safe from germs when you Did you know one in 30 baby boomers has hepatitis C? People born between 1945 and 1965 are five times more likely to have hepatitis C. Hepatitis C can hide in the body for years or even decades and can cause psoriasis, cancer, and even death. The good news is hepatitis C can be treated. The first step is to get a simple, free blood test. Don't be a statistic. Visit wakegov.com slash hep C today to schedule your free blood test. I'm here in downtown Raleigh with Jeffrey Hammerstein, Assistant Chief of the Wake EMS, as we conduct the inaugural Wake County EMS Heartbeats CPR training right here in the heart of downtown Raleigh. And Jeffrey, thanks so much for joining us. Talk about the importance of CPR training for anyone and, and, and how it is important for folks to understand what it takes to save a life. Uh, absolutely. So we're talking about the condition where somebody's heart stops. They're not beating, they're not breathing, they're not moving blood. If that's not treated quickly and with the right treatment, that person's not going to survive. We want to give them their best chance of survival. Call 911 if somebody collapses in front of you and be ready to start CPR. We're on the way. It's going to take us a minute to get there. That time while we're on the way is really critical for you to be able to help that person. And it's as simple as putting two hands together, pressing down in the center of the chest at about 100 beats to a, a minute. The song, Staying Alive, most people know that. You can search it if you don't. Go to that rhythm and two hands pressing in the center of the chest like you see behind us is actually something that can really do a lot to give that person their best chance of a good outcome in cardiac arrest or when their heart stops beating. A, a lot of folks are not aware, but mouth to mouth resuscitation is not the standard protocol. So there are classes that teach that, and that's fine if that's a class you've been through. You don't have to have had a class to be able to help somebody. It's as truly as simple as putting your two hands together. We can leave out the mouth to mouth and just do hands compre hand compressions, keep those compressions going until we get there. When the, when the heart stops, there's still an amount of oxygen that's in the blood. The critical thing that we've got to do is circulate that blood while we're on the way. When we get there, we're going to take care of the ventilation and the oxygen part. But we need for you to circulate that blood while we're on the way. The best way to do that, the most effective way to do that, is to do those chest compressions and do hard quality uninterrupted chest compressions until we get there. It's a really, really simple procedure. More than anything, it takes willingness to do so. Also, you know, obviously we're in the heart of, of the time where we're gonna see rising temperatures in the next several months. What can you, some tips you can give to, to residents about some of the signs of, of heat danger that's out there? Absolutely, an important thing to understand is that everybody is susceptible to heat emergencies. Young, old, in between, healthy, not as healthy, it can strike all of us, and prevention is a big part of that. Number one, making sure that you're staying hydrated. If you're gonna to to do activities, we're doing activities out in the heat today, but we know we gotta drink plenty of fluids ahead of time, we gotta take breaks, and we gotta drink fluids during and after to make sure we're uh, staying in good shape. If you yourself or you're with somebody who starts to feel confused, disoriented, not feeling well, you gotta take those signs seriously as a, a, a good likelihood of an impending heat emergency. Get out of the heat, get yourself cooled down, get some fluids in. Particularly if you start to feel things like muscle cramps, 
or you start to feel like somebody's not go going unconscious or not responding to you, uh, or if somebody stops sweating, any of those signs, we're starting to get into a real medical emergency then. If that's the case, get that person cooled down, hydrated if you can, and if they're not responding to you, then call 911 right away. Let us come out and help take care of that person. And Jeffrey, finally, how can uh, citizens find out more about not only CPR training, some of the uh, ways of protecting themselves and their loved ones uh, from the heat? Uh, how can they find out more information? Well, you can go straight to our website, wakegov.com slash EMS. We've got a button on the front page that says Learn CPR. Click on that and take a look around, learn some of the options to come out and, and learn how to do this and have some confidence. It's not difficult, it's willingness and just having the confidence, the confidence to step up and do that. Uh, we can help show people how, so look us up. Well, hopefully folks will take some wonderful tips that uh, you have shared with us and use them in practice. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you. We'll be back. even hold your box while you practice. Did you know one in 30 baby boomers has hepatitis C? People born between 1945 and 1965 are five times more likely to have hepatitis C. Hepatitis C can hide in the body for years or even decades and can cause psoriasis, cancer, and even death. The good news is hepatitis C can be treated. The first step is to get a simple, free blood test. Don't be a statistic. Visit wakegov.com slash hep C today to schedule your free blood test. Cross-contamination is when germs are spread from one place to another. Keep raw meat, poultry, seafood, and eggs separate from other foods to prevent cross-contamination. It's important to keep things separate even while you're at the grocery store. Always put raw meats, poultry, seafood, and eggs in separate plastic bags provided at the meat counter to keep their juices from getting onto other foods. If you use reusable grocery bags, be sure to wash them in a washing machine regularly. Once you get home from the store, it's just as important to keep things separate. Always put your raw meat, poultry, seafood, and eggs in plastic bags or sealed containers on a low shelf of the refrigerator away from the other foods. Be sure to throw away the plastic bags after you've taken raw meat, seafood, poultry, or eggs out of them. When preparing foods, always use separate plates and utensils for raw meat, poultry, seafood, and cooked foods. For example, never put cooked food on a plate that previously held raw meat, poultry, seafood, or eggs. Wash the plate with hot water and soap before using it for other foods. If you soak raw meat, poultry, or seafood in a sauce or marinade, boil the sauce or marinade before using it on cooked food. So remember, Keep raw meats, poultry, seafood, and eggs. Separate! Every year, Wake County hosts a number of summer camps for kids, from parks to libraries to the Sheriff's Department. This segment will show you a camp focusing on energy. Jennifer has more. We are here at the 2017 Wake County Energy Camp. Today, the kids are building solar cars to race. Come check it out with us. This is Carrie Oak. She's been a camp counselor here at the Wake County Energy Camp for two years. So Carrie, thanks for having us here today. Can you tell us a bit about what the campers are doing today here at Energy Camp? Well, today they are working on um, solar energy activity. They are building solar cars out of these really neat um, Lego build it kits and they're going to race the cars um, and see how they modify the cars and how that influences the performance as far as the distance that it goes and um, make it into a nice uh, fun competition for them and we have heats until there's a final champion at the end. So how does today's solar car race fit into the overall energy camp? Um, well it ties in with our mission to teach children about different um, alternative energy sources. So throughout the week, we've talked about wind energy, water energy, solar energy, and nuclear energy. And so earlier this week, we went to Southern Energy Management and learned about uh, solar cells. And so this ties in nicely. They actually get to see how a, sol a solar cell works and um, an experiment with it as well as an energy source. So the kids that are here today, as they get to build these cars, what types of things are they learning? Um, well, I think uh, collaboration skills and also um, 
you know, how the solar cell works, how um, modifying a uh, project and how it can influence the results and how um, the engineering process as well, I think. You know, when you try something out and if it doesn't work, how can I go back and problem solve it and uh, uh, fine tune my project and test it and retry it until I get the results that I'm looking for. So I think it's really meaningful for them. So congratulations, you won the solar car race. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about your car and uh, how you constructed it? Uh, I just made it as light as possible. For the race, did you have any sort of plan as far as how you're going to beat the other cars? I built it originally, like all the other ones, and realized it wasn't working, so I stripped it. So you're here at Energy Camp. What types of things have you learned this week at camp? Uh, just all about energy. Congratulations on your win. Thank you. So Bill, we are wrapping up Energy Camp for 2017. Tell us about the camp so far this year. Oh, it's going great. We got 40 great camp, you know, kids in camp, and they're really smart, and we're getting a lot of field trips, and we're learning a lot about energy, sustainability, and um, just new industries. So what types of field trips have the kids been on this year? We went to NC State for a physics demonstration. We talked to the water quality for the state. We went to uh, ABB, um, Eaton today. We went to uh, see a physics demonstration, Harris Plant, and today we raised solar cars. So you were telling me that you have been a counselor at this camp for about 20 years. What types of changes have you seen at Energy Camp over the years? Well, in 20 years, we have seen a lot of, uh, you know, more interest in this now. It's a lot, and it's really cool because some of the things we talked about before, with uh, like solar and wind and uh, the, the efficiency of different buildings, over the years now, you actually can see some of that stuff in place in Wake County. So that's really a really good thing. Well, even just exposing them to the different forms of energy and the renewable energies especially and the different industries. So hopefully, because they'll be our leaders of tomorrow and our innovators, so hope they can get inspired. And would you recommend parents of younger children look into this camp in the future? Yes, because right now at the camp, it's been for rising sixth graders, but it's through Wake County and about April, spring break time every year. It's online, the schools will get information and I would highly recommend it. For more information on Wake County's Energy Camp for rising sixth graders, visit wakegov.com slash energy slash camp. That's it for this segment of Wake TV. On a personal note, this will be my last segment hosting this wonderful public affairs show. It has been a pleasure to share with you some of the many services and programs that Wake County has to offer. Continue to watch and learn about this county through watching Wake TV on Twitter or on YouTube. Thanks again and have a wonderful day.